So our next speaker is Sun Kim. Uh, Sun Kim is an associate professor of School of Informatics and Computing. He's also a department chair and a director of Center of uh, Bioinformatics uh, Research. Thank you, Judy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cancer epigenetics study using the next generation sequencing data. I guess many of you, epigenomics is a really new terminology, so, but don't be scared. It's a really exciting terminology. Uh, here's an overview of the talk. So because many of you don't know the epigenetics and DNA methylation, and then I'm going to explain that you know, terminology about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to talk about briefly about our Ohio State University, Indiana University Center for Cancer Systems Biology. And then talk about how we map the sequence read from next generation sequencing data. And then what is the data? And then we we'll talk about our system called Bio Virtual Lab. And uh, for cancer, it's MCPG, it's a CPG, so C is a cytosine where the methylation occurs. Uh, first part is epigenomics and DNA methylation background. Epigenetics is a study of a heritable change in gene function that occur without the DNA change in the DNA sequence. This is very exciting because uh, you, you know that uh, there is a DNA sequence, there is, uh, say, the mutation, say, single nucleotide polynomial pigeon, those ones actually affect the genes, the transcription for important genes, and then so somebody mm -hmm. gets sick or somebody get uh, more disease susceptible, something like that. But epigenome is beyond the DNA sequence. There is a control mechanism actually beyond the DNA sequence uh, that change over time. For example, if we have uh, two identical twins, they live in the two different environments where, and then say one guy live in a very toxic environment, eventually that person easily develop for drugs, cancers, and something like that. But these two people have exactly the same DNA sequence. Why they have different disease susceptibility? We, scientists mostly conjecture now is because of that change in the epigenomics, which is acquired over time uh, from the environmental stimulus, something like that. So studying epigenomics is very exciting. And uh, until recently, it was not possible to study the epigenetics entire genome-wide, whole genome, you know, human genome-wide, something like that. But because of sequencing technology development, it's really developed very fast. I think many of you heard about next generation sequencing technology. Now we are talking about third generation sequencing technology. So that technology is really moving fast and then generate a huge amount of data. Because of the quantity and speed of data generation, we can actually measure the epigenomics finally, genome-wide. This is for the first time in the history of science. And then this is basically include the DNA methylation, which is a cytosine, the, the, there's a methyl group attached there and then changes. And then proteins, where the histone modification and also microRNA, many people include as epigenomic mechanism. So epigenetics is actually is a study of this epigenetic change in a genome scale, entire human genome. So here is a cartoon showing the what is epigenetic mechanism. We have, uh, as you know, the, we have DNA, and then the, this DNA is actually, I'm sorry, wrapped around the uh, wrapped around the histone. Here you you see the blue circle. That is a protein. And then there is a protein, DNA is wrapped around those regions. And then to be a gene active, the figure here, this histone structure should open up. You know, it's like intuitively, if DNA is wrapped around tightly packed, gene cannot be active there, right? So it should open up. And then open up is most of the histone a mechanism, we know that that's actually really good markers in showing the, where the histone opens and closes. And then open the DNA structure. There, if it, also there is a DNA methylation change, the methylation occurs or not, actually determines genes activa activation inactivations. So DNA methylation is, uh, is a basically methyl groups attached to DNA backbones. 
So using the, the with the help from the DNA method transferase. And uh, this epigenetic mechanism is a normal. It's not abnormal. For example, the, if we, ha we got uh, one DNA from our parents, and then start DNA, our cell replicate, and it becomes a tissue specific. You say some cells make a nose, some cells make an eye, liver, and whatever, the, our dis different tissues. And then we know that each tissue, set of genes expressed in the tissue, they are different. For example, gene cells expressed in the, say, eye, they are different from gene cells expressed from our liver, or something like that. Then, our original DNA, one cell from our parents, they replicate and differentiate and becomes tissue specific. Who controls that mechanism? Largely determined by the epigenetic mechanism. So basically, the epigenetic mechanism is kind of program that for each of the genes, you guys turn on, you guys turn off, something like that, as you go on. How this uh, control mechanism acquired and how it works, we have a very, very limited knowledge because, again, it is until very recently, we did not have any data for this one. Now we have data. So this is a very normal mechanism. However, in cancer, there's also very interesting things happened. Happens is that uh, in cancer, two things happen. One is a global hypo, small, less methylation occurs, meaning that most of genes are free. Basically, if you have a DNA methylation in the promoter region of genes, it says you guys are off. You are inactive. Then, however, global hypo methylation occurs, meaning that many of genes, you guys are free. So cancer is basically, the, in terms of gene expression, it is very unstable cells because you know, many, many genes should not be expressed, they're expressed. And then also there's a very interesting phenomenon occurs that there's a region-specific hypermethylation occurs, which is that certain genes, for example, there are genes which triggers the cell death. Actually, cancer is kind of, is roughly say, it's like an uncontrolled cell growth. So basically, then there's a genes which turn on that kind of mechanism. In cancer cell, those mechanism is kind of out of order. So if the, the region-specific hyper more methylation occurs, important cancer suppressing genes, they are off. So cancer is free. So they basically replicate the cells. So this kind of epigenetic mechanism is actually important things that, that accumulate. Usually DNA methylation, once you acquire, it's not really transient. They, they accumulate over time. So for example, starting from the normal cells, cancers and the cancer becomes worse and eventually becomes metastasized. And that kind of disease stage, DNA methylation actually accumulate and then there's more and more DNA methylation occurs in a region-specific regions. So that's why it's a heritable change. So once you acquire, usually they keep it. The region-specific hypermethylation is important. So there's a short stretch of DNA called the CPG island. It's basically small DNA region. There's a lot of CG dinucleotide that appears there. That is so-called the CPG island. It's not just sequence-wise interesting, it's very interesting in terms of uh, methylation. In the normal cell, CPG island, they are protected from DNA methylation. Why? We don't know yet. But in cancer cells, cancer actually that attack those regions, they actually acquire more methylation for important cancer suppressing genes. So many things still we don't know. So that's why we are collecting the data. I'm going to show the data some some of the data later. So basically, as you know, the, our genes, is not really a big chunk of one contiguous DNA sequence. We have uh, axons and the introns. For example, you, you see here is a number one, two, three, four, those blocks is axons. And then between the two blocks, we call it introns. Axon is basically DNA region they express the eventually they translate into protein. Those ones is axon regions. Intron regions are regions they express 
transcribed, but they are not really translated into proteins. And then there is a CPG island. As you can see, the, here is a normal cell, here is a cancer cell. So cancer cell, CPG island, CPG dinucleotide. I'm sorry, there is a methylation occurs there. Basically, this gene is blocked. If this gene is a cancer suppressing gene, which initiate uh, you know, cancer the suppressing mechanism, for example, apoptosis, then you know, it is very advantageous for cancer. So we talked about the DNA methylation, and then there's also a mechanism called histone modifications. So we have a protein called histone, and then DNA is wrapped around. As I told you, this wrapped around compact structure should open up to be the genes active. We don't know, but there's a lot of um, methylation, this time methylation, amino acid methylation, it's not DNA, the cytosine. Methylation, acetylation, those are combinations. Actually, so K9 means that here, you see, K9 is lysine 9, position 9, lysine. Methylation occurs. Then same genes, what, what I'm showing here in this uh, figure is that same genes, you know, normal cells, there is actually combinations of methylation, nicin 9 and nicin K5 and K4, trimethylation. Those on combination is the actual markers for DNA, genes active. In a cancer cell, if you see that those ones are K9, dimethylation, 2-methylation, and then K27, trimethylation, that is a marker for the genes inactive. That's, that's why we call this is a histone code. Basically, there's a I think 39 different combinations of histone uh, methylation, acetylation. Those combinations, like a computer code, they code that you know, genes active and inactive status. We don't know, we don't have a computer knowledge yet. There's another code mechanism called the microRNA. It's a very small chance microRNA is interfere with the transcribed genes. So then genes becomes transcribed and then try to make a protein, for example. The microRNA can interfere and they can degrade the, those genes. So this kind of uh, combinations of DNA methylation, histone modification, microRNA, in combination, what happens in cancer, that is our project. So the project is uh, funded by the National Cancer Institute since 2004, for 10 years, until 15, uh, 2015. Uh, NCI has a very wonderful program called the Integrative Cancer Biology Program, which requires half of the copy should be computer or mathematicians, and the half should be cancer biologists. Otherwise, you are not qualified to submit the cancer, the center proposal. So it's a really wonderful mechanism to enhance collaboration between the you know, computer scientists, mathematicians, and the cancer biologists. Our project goal is to looking for drug resistance mechanism in human cancers, in breast cancer, prostate cancer, and ovarian cancers. This is very important because originally those cancers, the breast and prostate ovarian cancer, they have drug targets, which is the like initiation of those uh, you know, the cancers. For example, breast, as you know, the estrogen, human, the woman's hormone is important. Prostate, androgen, man's hormone is very important. And uh, ovarian cancer, is, uh, there's uh, TGF-beta, is a chemical mechanism very important. And so we know those pathways then our cancer treatment actually basically target that biological pathways. But when you treat the patient with drugs, and then cancer becomes, looks okay, and then later cancer relapse. And then usually cancer relapse, they cancer develop somehow drug resistance mechanism. We don't know why, how, but they become cancer again with drug resistance mechanism, meaning that we don't have any treatment for the patient. So understanding this mechanism is our cancer center project. So cartoon here is showing that what we are trying to understand is that we have coding genes. 
And then coding genes, in nature, they transcribe and make a messenger RNA. Then we look for the promoter region. There is a CPG island, which is uh, methylation protected. And then how, how methylation occurs in each of the promoter regions, CPG, and then transcription factors and histone modification. And then microRNA, the combined way, you know, we try to understand the, all the interactions as a cancer patient develop drug resistance cancers. So our second stage of our, our, our cancer center is actually second stage because it's a five year funding. So we just started the second stage, which is a 2010 to 15. So we, for the DNA methylation, which I'm uh, working on it, and then so I'm not working on the histone modification part right now. So we basically sequence six cell lines of data, which is a breast cancer has a before and after drug resistance, and then prostate cancer before and after drug resistance, and then ovarian cancer before and drug after drug resistance. And then we look for the DNA methylation later, histone modification, microRNA, gene expression, those ones, and data comes in from other copy in our center. We integrate and we try to understand those ones. So basically what I'm talking about today is a very simple, relatively simple analysis. We want to look for difference in the DNA methylation genome-wide, the cells become before and after drug resistance mechanism develop. And then later, of course, we are going to integrate with histone modification microRNA gene expression data phenotypes. So what we are going to looking for is that this cartoon again showing that the if you cartoon show, for example, promoter methylation and then downstream genes expression, how do they correlate in terms of uh, entire human genome? And then promoter methylation transcription factors, which try to find in the promoter regions of the those genes, what happens? And then intergenic methylation and alternative splicing for important cancer genes. And the methylation in non-CPG context, and those kind of things is uh, the analysis target right now. So how is this measure is that now next generation sequencing data can measure those uh, by the sequencing. So sequencing is done by the by uh, sequencing the by sulfide treated DNA. I'm sorry, this is uh, now is another terminology comes in, but basically it's a simple. It's a methylated, you see the here, red one, is a C is a cytosine, methylated cytosine. But if you look for the, these two Cs, there's no M's, meaning that those cytosines are non-methylated. If you treat by sulfide, unmethylated the cytosine becomes U, and when you make a DNA, it's a T. However, methylated cytosine remains as a C. So that's the mechanism we can measure the site-specific methylation where it occurs. And then later we sequencing it does. Problem here is that uh, when you do the sequencing, we really cannot distinguish uh, T, U, T here, original T versus the T converted from unmethylated cytosine. So mapping here is a little bit complicated and time consuming. So challenging the mapping the sequence read from bisulfide treated DNA is a lot of read. It's a basically several hundred million to billions read for one cell line. And then also because of cytosine bisulfide tre uh, treatment, we basically have a three alphabet. So DNA origin is a four alphabet and then it becomes a three character alphabet. You know, many computer guys, you know, as you can easily imagine, you know, the if it's only three alphabet, mapping the read is actually takes a lot more time. So here's an example of the real data. This is uh, the, the Adam 12 genes promoter gen DNA methylation. If you sequence a lot and then we make uh, the alignment and then we can just count how many CGs, how many TGs in one column. And then we know the methylation level for specific cytosine at that level.
So how much time, how much data we have is the, this is a recent article I just captured from there. Uh, if you look at the left, left uh, right hand side of Kazam human genome, this table try to map the 11 read, 11 million read, which is uh, one or two magnitude smaller, really toy data set compared to real data set. But it's 11 million read. Uh, these are the, each row is a columns of most widely used algorithms. And then this paper is about the GNU map. GNU map actually mapped 7.7 uh, .7 million read, and then it takes uh, 985 minutes. And then the fastest one, I'm sorry, Bowtie takes uh, 14 minutes, but it can map only, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to <laughs> use mouse then, then 6.6 .6 million read. So basically, the mapping the 1.1 billion lead, the computing time increased dramatically. And anyone who working on the algorithm easily can understand you know, this kind of complexity. So data we are going to map is a six method of data, and then two cell line data from the last year. Nature paper has a first for the first time two cell line whole genome wide data is available. And then rough calculation is uh, total CPU uh, is about uh, 800,000 hours of CPU time is required to map this data. So we need uh, to use, uh, for example, you know, the, for example, Bowtie and then the BS, BS map, those kind of algorithms, we can use multi-core naturally, it's written that way. But, you know, the mapping the a read uh, require for 800,000 hour CPU hours, you know, we need to use uh, different strategy. For example, the memory use is one of the target we are going to set up there. So to map this data and then analyze data and then those ones, because of data volume, also we are dealing with the entire human genome, which is a three billion positions. So that requires a lot of tools, a lot of data transfers. So we are building a system called Bio Virtual Lab MCPG Methylation CPG. So we are working on the Bio Virtual Lab at, uh, using Amazon Cloud Computing and then Graphical Workflow Composer Expire. Actually, Jong there is a, he's the one first one who used the, the this system developed this system three years ago. I think uh, you are the first one who used Amazon for bioinformatics application at that time, three years ago. And then what we are trying to do is uh, we have a pre-composed workflow and then put on the web and then user just uh, set up the Amazon account or any cloud computing or any you know, the machines and then download the workflow composer and then just run it. But beauty is that because it uses a graphical workflow composer, user can actually modify visually. So it allows a small change. So bio virtual lab architecture is basically three layer architectures. One is a front layer is actually the x -bio graphical workflow composer. And then basically this system is using the you know, web as an interface. So web and the, and the graphical workflow composer x -bio is a front layer. The, so that's the user see. Behind that, user don't have to see. The middle layers are a little bit complicated. This is, I think, is a dense Gannon's architecture, right? uh, and best place. And then, so inside the middle layer is a little bit complicated. So user don't need to set up this kind of systems. Has a GFAG, X registry, OGC, and then pops of system and my proxy. And then back end is computing unit, which can we by default we are using Amazon cloud computing, but any system can put on there. It doesn't really matter. So here's a snapshot of the, our current prototype of methylation, the mapping systems. The, every time when you see the, here's a, let me explain a little bit of panels. The left upper panel shows all the tools users can use. So basically, user can drag and drop and then compose the workflows. So it's a very easy to use workflow composer. Actually, most of workflow works like that. And then right panel is uh, showing the workflow. We, uh, for this one, is a DNA mapping and analysis. And the uh, bottom panel shows the status of what we are doing right now. So every time you see the green icon, 
in green color. So that's the current status. So as of now, we have uh, two data sets. One is a prostate cancer before DNA cell line and after DNA cell line, and then human genome sequence. So three is green right now. As a and then BS map algorithm is uh, starting mapping the sequence. So it maps the sequence, but because it has a, I think about 200, 200 million the read, so I cannot show you movie. Usually I show the movie, but you know this one <laughs> I cannot do that. So after you know going through the, all the workflow, and then at the end of the stage, what we are showing here is a UCS genome browser. As I told you, we are dealing with the entire human genome, which is uh, three billion characters. Visualization is a very difficult issue. So one of the most widely used web-based visualization system is the UCS genome, genome browser. And uh, so our system directly connect after mapping the sequence. So this is uh, one of the gene promoter regions of methylation snapshot. The red is a before drug resistance, and the blue one is uh, after drug resistance, showing the little bit of the DNA methylation difference. Uh, this is just visualization. Later, we uh, summarize you know, in terms of important biological pathways, something like that. So my presentation is short because I'm instructed for 30 minute presentation. So thank you for Hee Che, who currently managing this project. And then Young Ik is graduate, uh, and uh, Hyung No Jung is here. And then thanks for Suresh and Chatura and Madon, and uh, who works and provides us, you know, infrastructure for bio virtual lab. Ken Nephew and Tim Wangs, they are leaders uh, for our cancer center, and uh, NCI project, and then Telegrid, and then IU, right, yes. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank uh, San for his uh, intriguing talk about the important problem to address uh, cancers. Any questions? Yes. How easy would it be to extend this to uh, animal genomes? Uh, I think the, the animal genome DNA methylation study. Well, I'm just thinking perhaps you'd like to do that one day. Composing, uh, the, depending on what you want to do, and then you know, setting up the system takes a little bit of effort. After that, running it is just easy. Can a question. Um, why did you choose to use the uh, Amazon EC2 for your cloud computing? Uh, that's because uh, Chong used the Amazon EC2 at that time three years ago. The, you know, just it's uh, one of the examples of uh, Amazon EC2 at that time. I think that's the uh, three years ago. Amazon was the only cloud computing available in the world. I believe so. So building your own solution was not an option. Oh, you know, the, I'm, you know I'm, I'm just one faculty member. I don't want to build my own cloud system, unless the university or the NIH give a lot of money for me. Jong, <laughs> you want to say what something? I'm sorry. Jong, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, right, yeah. In, in addition to that, yeah, Amazon was the first the cloud service three years ago, and I believe that currently we can, the, any cloud service can be plugged in by using the any cloud service based on Eucalyptus, which is similar to the Amazon EC2. Ah, there is actually yeah. another point. I'm sorry. There is actually another point. As you know, though, there is a different types of cloud computing service. We actually want to use a infrastructure as a service cloud computing rather than you know software service as a cloud service something like that. So we basically want the infrastructure as a service cloud computing infrastructure. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you very well. Did you find that that was cost effective? In other words, you mean cost effective? Or what was it? The money that you paid Amazon was that less than what it would have cost to have. Uh, that is actually a good question. I'm testing right now. For example, you know, mapping the billions of read, probably Amazon we have to pay a lot. Actually, honestly. We just use a small data set to test our systems, but we didn't use, you know, the, try the entire full set of data. Actually, honestly, 
we are using currently teragrid for mapping because teragrid support our mapping but but you know the as uh, you know the we expect almost all majority medical school you know research group will do the you know dna methodization study if they don't have really good infrastructure and then probably you know the downloading workflow and then just hook him to any of cloud computing service and then mapping the read mm -hmm. probably then is more cost effective rather than bugging somebody and then try to map also you know for example it's less be realistic if a cancer scientist hire one bioinformatics student usually we have to pay about 40k per year right and including tuition and all those ones depending on the private public schools and even though we find the bioinformatics student there's no guarantee that student is good i'm sorry for the student right so some cancer scientists you know hire one guy pay 40k and then try to map his sequence data there's no guarantee sequence data will be met analyzed so in that case probably some someone may don't mind to pay say five thousand dollars to map the sequence using this kind of infrastructure i don't know i'm testing i don't know yet Any more questions? Okay, great. Can I ask one more quick question? Go ahead. Um, Go ahead, please. Could I, um, I'm interested in the middleware that you used? You had a slide showing the front end and then on the back end you had Amazon. You had uh, some middleware there. Can you say anything more about that? Yeah, actually, the one of the my preference using this uh, infrastructure is, first of all, because it invented at IU. So it's a local, but the one thing I really like this infrastructure, you know, the there's a lot of different scientific workflow composers there, and then, so I can choose any of them. But XY architecture actually has a middleware, middle layer, which is a gateway. Uh, I like that idea a lot because uh, a lot of people working on science don't know is that, you know, for example, ask somebody collect a database and computational tools for DNA methodization on a data analysis. Can you do that? How many people in the world can you do that? Not really. So meaning is that what I'm trying to build up is kind of value-added application-oriented cloud, meaning that all the tools for specific scientific application is all installed. And then from the X by a laptop panel, all resources are visible there. So what we are providing users is kind of, kind of pre-compiled resource set. And then I can manage easily manage from the gateway. That's what my preference. This sounds like a perfect uh, application for packing up images on the cloud. And then Marlon wants to say something about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I w just wanted to plug myself. Uh, so the, the, the software that Sun Kim was using, uh, and you asked about the middleware. Uh, so that's uh, downloadable from uh, the Open Grid Computing Environments project. So, uh, so Jong here actually uh, pioneered a lot of that. Uh, usage stuff that, that Sun Kim described, but all that software is, is packaged and we're still working with uh, Sun Kim for uh, deploying it on both uh, clouds and TerraGrid uh, resources as you described here. Thank you, Matt. Hi, Ben, so has a question. Um, have you gotten any re results yet on your searches for You are asking about uh, specific whether DNA method is what's the interesting findings, something like that. Is it correct? Or? Well, there's already good lab evidence demonstrating two different types of mechanisms. One is metal binding overexpression that occurs through metal ion presence that act, you know, acts through transcription passes. I'm not sure if that's through a hyper 
a methylation mechanism or another one, but that's well established. Then there's the peak glycoprotein, which is present in other ones. The calcine is associated mostly with uh, cisplatin resistance, but adrenomycin and glycoprotein The, that, you know, for this data, I'm yet to answer your question because uh, we just got sequence I just mapped and then so some of the information I need permission from my collaborators. But in the cisplatin and uh, those kind of drug resistant cancers, actually one of several our publication, for example, one paper in bioinformatics, our group's paper showing that hypermethylated region actually has a overrepresented transcript factor binding site, which means that those kind of certain types of uh, binding sites actually overrepresent in that hypermethylated region, meaning that in even though those TF becomes active, that hypermethylation becomes kind of mechanism blocking the binding of those TF. So th there are actually many different ways of looking at the data and kind of scientifically, but I think this is too much for audience right now. <laughs> Yes, yes, we can do that. Um, the, do you want to go to the Google site? Uh, there's a Google group, so please post that on the link. Right. If there's no more questions, then we'll conclude our session today. And uh, tomorrow we'll start at 11 a.m. Uh, at the Eastern Time with our second keynote speakers. Thank right. you. Thank you.